Welcome to the Cracked Magazine panel. I'm Dick Culp, a former publisher and editor of what we consider to be probably the best Cracked magazines of the entire <laughs> run, dating back to 1958. Uh, sitting next to me, however, is Mort Todd, who was the editor of Cracked Magazine during its golden age, during its heyday, when their circulation was probably a little bit bigger than mine. And uh, uh, next to Mort is Austin Janowski, who is an artist extraordinaire himself. He's also an actor on television. He's appeared in numerous commercials uh, and several other uh, TV-type movie things. So he's uh, on his way to becoming, you know, he's on his way to his first Oscar. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, what I would like to do, because Mort was here before me, is that I would like to turn this over to Mark. Maybe he can give us an overview as to what Cracked Magazine was and, and how that started. So, Mark, well, go ahead. Well, I thank you. Uh, as, uh, since nobody here knows what Cracked Magazine is, I'll give a little primer. Uh, everyone's heard of Mad Magazine. Well, you know, Mad Magazine started in the mid-50s as a comic book before it became a black and white sophisticated magazine. And it was quite a success, so of course, there were a lot of imitators. And uh, one of those imitators was called Cracked Magazine and featured a lot of people who used to work at MAD or would later work at MAD. And it was the most successful of the imitators, lasting from 1958 until... 2004. Four. So since then, it's become a website, and some, a lot of people are more familiar with a website, which is basically just boiled down to 10 stupidest things about stupid things or something like that and everything. So It's not cracked. It's called cracked. Yeah, they have the logo, but, the but, but it's just like, you know, it's like a low-budget BuzzFeed or something like that. Yeah. So originally, it was a, a full-blown humor magazine that would make fun of movies, TV shows, popular trends, and featured some of the most legendary comic book creators in the world. And for a while, their editorial offices were indeed in Floridia for many decades, probably from like, I think the early 60s until uh, the company I worked for bought it in 1985 when they moved it all to New York. And uh, so it was very well known as like a fifth rate mad ripoff. And when I took over, I like to think that I turned it into at least a third-rate mad ripoff. And um, it was a very fun time for me. I was, I was 23 and living in New York with a ridiculous budget and getting to work with fa my fam favorite comic book artist that I grew up with. So it was a dream project. And, you know, I had an expense account where, you know, since we made fun of everything or anything, I didn't have to pay for anything. Like... We were making fun of movies, so I didn't have to pay for movies. And that's just it. I go see about half a dozen movies at least a week during business hours and then have to have like, you know, three hour liquid lunch meetings with <laughs> writers and artists. And, you know, we were making fun of like food, so they paid the restaurant bills and the toys. Like, you know, we'd make fun of uh, Mad Balls, so I bought every single Mad Ball, or if we were doing, you know, Transformers or Voltron, I'd go like, you know what, I need one of those six-foot-tall metal Voltrons that have the six lions that come apart and put together and everything. So it was a real fun time, and uh, we did some incredible stuff. We worked with, like I said, a lot of uh, famous artists that I liked as a kid, but I also cultivated a lot of new artists that were friends of mine that became you know, big superstars of the underground comics industry and stuff like that. So it was a really good time. Just to add to that, many of the artists he's speaking of sort of helped establish the groundwork for that which we are now appearing at today, the Comic Con. Uh, John Severin is an example. Uh, Bill Ward's an example. Uh, Don Martin, who worked for Mad Magazine, came over and worked for Crack Magazine. I got him. He, he was called Mad's Maddest Artist, and he'd been there for 30 years. But the thing was, and this is true with all artists at Mad, they didn't get their original artwork back. They weren't allowed to own their copyright. And they got paid well. So I basically just called up uh, Don Martin, and 
his wife. The best comic artists have their wife do the work, so you got to get through the wife first. You know? And um, and we said, we'll give you your artwork back, we'll give you your copyright, and pay you the same. And it was like, zoom! And it made, uh, it legitimately made world headlines, because he was a phenomenal talent that was so popular in Sweden and Germany and all over the world, so it was like a real big deal. and. And that was a big thing for creator rights because I was always into that because, you know, until then, artists would always get screwed by the companies. They would own everything. It would be work for hire. So when I started working at Cracked, I made sure they didn't do that because... Uh, well, that was across the board. I mean, mm -hmm. DC, Marvel, all of them, writers, they had what was called bullpens. So writer's bullpen, artist's bullpen. They were basically, you got weekly paychecks or whatever, and whatever you created, they owned completely. If you're on site and you worked for them. Well, that, even with freelance, it, it was called work for hire. Yeah. Even if you didn't get paid health insurance, all that stuff, mm -hmm. on the back of your checks, Marvel would have a rubber stamp that says, I give everything and my children and everything for the rest of the world and all the universe. And you had to sign it to endorse the check, which you know is pretty much illegal and junk. So. That changed in the 80s and 90s right. when uh, they started doing creator-owned and semi-creator-owned stuff. So if you created anything after that, any new characters, they would own the copyright, but you'd get you know, royalties of licensing if they made a toy or Residuals, a TV show or yeah, something. Yeah. But uh, as I was telling Dick earlier, the advantage when I started at Cracked was the company that bought Cracked that I worked for were in advertising and never worked in publishing, so they didn't know all this dirt. What was the name of the company? Uh, well, it was called Larkin Communications, but okay. they did all the advertising for Globe magazines, which ended up buying it outright. Gotcha. But they didn't know anything about publishing, so I was like, <laughs> we ain't gonna have no work for higher contracts. Mm. So all the artists own their own work, and you know, I started making sure artists got reprint money and stuff like that, and their artwork back and things like that, which right. was a big deal because. I also started out as a writer and artist too, so you know I worked both sides of the fence and you know knew that they were getting screwed and that you can you can make everybody happy. Everyone can make some money, and you don't really necessarily have to screw the artist. Well, they speak of creator rights and ownership. How many of you ever heard of Jack Kirby? Okay, Jack Kirby is the guy who created Captain America. Uh, of course, he was on the ground floor of Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, almost yeah. everything that was out there, even though Stan Lee took all the credit. Basically, Stan Lee was kind of the, the mouthpiece. The well, he was, he was that, staff. Yeah. And so, what? but Jack, the story has it that one day he went with a friend to a Toys R Us, and he advised a friend that he would he refused to enter it. <coughs> because, and the guy says, well, why? He says, well, because I'm going to walk in there, I'm going to see all my characters, and I'm not getting a dime for it, for any of them. Mm -hmm. And I feel for them. Now, I published the magazine, so as a publisher, I come at it from a different perspective. Because we also know on the totem pole that the publisher is the last person to be paid. <laughs> when you put it up. You were in the wrong company then. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, when you're a publisher, you see... The, you got to pay the distributor, you got to pay the retailers, you got to pay the staff, you got to pay the print bill. And then when it's all said and done, whatever's left is what you've made. And when you see that the distributor takes a good like 43% of the whole thing, you got a problem. And so it was not, and a lot of people did not understand that as, as far as publishers. However, we're, we're supposed to cry for the publisher? Well, let me say it this way. If you don't have a publisher, you ain't got a magazine. This is very true. That's the problem. And so it was, a, and in my particular case, when I took it over, there were so many shenanigans involved, uh, I expected this amount of money, and I wound up with half by surprise. And all of a sudden, I found I didn't have enough money to really publish a magazine. But I fought, and I kept with it for four years anyway. Okay, take it over my dead body. <laughs> Go ahead, make my day. Of course, it caused a lot of problems with people, you know, because we wound up, ha it took forever to pay some of these guys because we had to wait till we put out the magazine. Okay, we'll see our money six months later for that particular issue. So I would only be able to put out three issues in succession and then I'd have to wait 
another three months for the money from the first issue to appear so then I could schedule another issue because it cost like 13000 to print. And that's what I was dealing with. And so, you know, yeah, you, 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 want, you, you want creator rights. You want to give people an incentive to make it even better and invest into it because then if you get movie deals and stuff like this, which is what comics have become, you know, uh, storyboards for the movies, basically, springboards for them, that's where your money really is nowadays, especially in the days of the Internet where you can get all this stuff for free, go online, look for this, look for that. Uh, instead of paying five bucks a magazine for a, you know, for a magazine, you're going to pay a couple bucks or a buck for an online presentation. So that's how publications and magazines work these days. And there is, you know, a changeover. It's like the days from the sailing ships to the days of the steam-powered ships. You don't need any more sailboat operators. Now, now got, they got digital boats. Now we have digital boats. <laughs> so it's a cra it's a huge change. And this was billed as somewhat of a showdown between old Martin and I because, you know, the old guard, they look at what we did. Like I said, we came, took over Crack Magazine, and we just improved the hell out of it, in my opinion. That is my opinion. See, that's how I felt when I took it over. That's right. And we all have our own imprint and stamp on it. And of course, but nonetheless, what cracked was, was a piece of history because it was there. Bill Gaines, the owner of Mad Magazine, has a, a allegedly created a voodoo doll <laughs> that he stuck because of all the competition, all the competitive, the, the ripoff, so to speak. And he stuck a pin in each time one of them croaked, such as, and that's the name. Every the name, that's a good sick, name. crazy, nuts, riot. Fooey. Uh, there there yeah, are dozens died, of mad ripoffs. He would put a pin in the doll. You know, that, that represents, or he'd take a pin out. That's what yeah. it was. And but he never one, got to crack. There was one last pin in that doll, and it was cracked. And according to Lou Silverstone, who was the editor prior to me, he said that cracks enjoyed its greatest circulation run during the crack epidemic. Well, uh, that's not true. Well, that's what he told me. See, uh, what I really enjoyed as a, like, again, I was, star I was 23 when I started, and I loved the rivalry with MAD because I, I, I saw them as the establishment. You know, even though there were all these hippies and stuff, they were, you know, in their 50s and 60s writing for, like, what they thought were six-year-olds, whereas, like, I was 23 and I was writing for people my age. And if 10-year-olds got it and dug it, which they did, I was happy with it. But I love the rivalry with MAD because, like I said, I thought they were the establishment. They were ripping off the artists. They were keeping their artwork. They weren't giving them reprints. There'd be, like, uh, movie companies would call them wanting to use an artist to, to do a movie poster. And, and they wouldn't give them the information to contact the artist. So, like, some of these studios found the artist in spite of MAD, like... You know, they got Mort Drucker to do the American Graffiti poster and stuff like that. But, you know, Mad was like anti-artist, so I loved screwing them. And we had a lot of their creators working undercover for us because if they revealed their real name, they would get fired immediately. So we had them working under pseudonyms, and that's how Lou Silverstone started. He was, uh, he, he was a longtime writer for Mad and started writing for me. And so he was still my spy at MAD. So like when we stole Don Martin, Bill Gaines it was just exploded. He, he was telling, Silverstone told me once they were at a MAD party and they were in the men's room using the urinal. And uh, Bill Gaines was just like, I can't believe the brass balls on that guy because I just love pushing their buttons. And uh, before I was at Cracked, Whenever Cracked did a mad parody, forget about it. There would be like lawsuits. Like you, Mad could make fun of anybody, but <coughs> it, when you started making fun of Mad, they they sued. So like there were all these file copies where like, do not use because it had Alfred E. Newman and all this. Stuff. <coughs> Those are the first things I reprinted because I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to stick it to them. And fortunately, my publisher was such that like. Go for it. If they sue us, man, that would be great publicity. And I, I really, I took it to an extreme, and it never happened. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say. Well, you know, speaking of uh, uh, infringement, 
I was at a Comic Con one day, and someone came up to me, sat next to me, and says, you know, Alfred E. Newman is public domain. And I said, what? Yeah. The, the likeness of Alfred E. Newman. Everyone know who Alfred E. Newman character. is? Everyone says, oh, Mad is original. Uh, stop ripping off, Mad. Mad ripped that off from a 1930s postcard. It's even older than that. Really? It was revolutionary America, painless dentist ad. There used to be ads for painless dentists that said, what, me worry with a guy with no tooth? <laughs> and then, yeah, in the 30s, they would have like postcards. Coney Island, the symbol of Coney Island was a, a, what they called the idiot, which was, was that, that, that face in neon in the 30s. But they would have postcards with like a Chinese version that would say, what me worry? You know, like it was his name in Chinese. And no, but Alfred E. Newman's been around since the 1700s. So there you go. So all of a sudden, Mad's main character, of course, their was a ripoff. And we used to get a lot of criticism. You know, oh, Mad, Croc, you're just a ripoff of Mad. No, we're not. I mean, is, is Ford a ripoff of Chevy or vice versa? Well, none of that. In the 1920s and 30s, there were college humor magazines like Ballyhoo. And there were tons of precedents for Mad. In fact, the original Life magazine in the 19th century was a humor magazine. And there, in England, there was Punch and Judge. There was tons of precedents for Mad. It was just that, like, they kind of congealed it and consolidated it. But Ballyhoo, in particular, was Dell magazine in the 30s. And, like, college humor, like Lampoon, before it was National Lampoon. Yeah, I will say, being, <coughs> being the new person here, I, I remember National, and I remember Crack, and I remember Mad, and I remember reading growing up Crack Magazine over Mad, and specifically because... I never believe it when people say that. You no, know, the reason is because <laughs> when I collected comic books, I started with Marvel and DC, but I loved the independents. I mean, t I bought Teenage Mutant number one, and I bought a lot of the independents and a lot of the underground, and that was my thing. So when I broke into comic books, I'm an indie guy first and foremost. Yeah, I've worked out for Marvel and, and everything like that, but I, my first book I put out was back in 94. It was based on D&D &D characters. You know what I mean? So I, I affiliated with Crack because I saw that Crack was trying to... They were the rebels. Yeah, they were just trying <laughs> to stick it to Mad because Mad was, like, the, like you said, the established. And being a fan of, of that sort of humor, Crack was like my thing. Like, I love the characters. I love the stories. I love the artwork. I like the different art styles. It seemed that Mad would have like one basic style, and that was really kind of it. And then I noticed that it just had a broader, more open. So you're probably story. reading it when I was editor, yeah, eighty five to ninety. Yeah, absolutely. Because so. uh, like what you say about independence, that was the same thing with me a few years earlier. I was growing up reading under everything. Started Marvel, DC. Yeah. Started reading Underground. Yeah. I, I got permission from my mom. Start reading National Lampoon when I was eleven you know because it was kind of dirty and stuff so like i just read anything comics and everything so by the time i was in, put in a position of mad, mad i was going to say mad power but cracked power yeah that's just it i could draw from all that and grab all these artists oh, yeah. old and new because that like you say mad had just gotten homogenized right and you could count on all these great artists every issue, but I'd like to mix it up and have a variety. That's the whole point. So then when I first met Dick, I, I fanboyed. <laughs> I, 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 he didn't know that, but I totally did because he's, you know, Eric Marion, he's a publisher. He's really great. So I'm talking to him and super nice guy and, and it was really great. <coughs> and then I'm doing a show in Orlando and next thing I find out, he, he's doing the show in Orlando and he wanted to come talk to me about helping him, you know, kind of relaunch the magazine and work on a Donald Trump story. And I got to tell you, Dick, and I'm not just saying this, that is one of the defining moments in my comic career. Wow. Bar none. Well, you guys you. want to sit closer? Should no, I? no. <laughs> I'm just because, I mean, I remember, because here's the coolest thing. Mom and, my mom and dad, like I said, when I told them I want to do comic books, they're like, that's great. You can have a backup plan. And I, I did and all that. To, to say, you know, Mom, go to Walmart. You can find it in the magazine section. She didn't believe me, and then when she saw <laughs> it, she bought it out. Like, she gave it to, like, all her friends. 
that like legitimized me as an artist. I mean, Marvel and DC is one thing, but this is crack magazine. No wonder we had a spike in sales. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what the hell but happened. But that was that was a defining moment, and then be able to hang out with you at Heroes Con while we were launching and doing everything like that was just like I said, it's a defining moment for me. It's just it's it's great. So I'm very thankful to a have a small piece in the moment. Well, Seriously. thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. just to mention, when I was talking about Alfred E., that, that gentleman who had sat down next to me to tell me that it was a public domain character, was, his name was Al Feldstein. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I got it he, from the, He was the editor of MAD for like 30, 40, yeah. almost 40 years. Yeah. So it was, uh, you know, I considered the source to be rather, you know... Legit. Legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Well, I, like I said, I, I'm just such a comic geek growing up. I did, uh, once I was a crack as well, I did my research and found out about this painless dentistry thing, and I was just like, That's funny. I was like, Mad, please sue us so we can go to court right. and say that you have a character that is in the public domain <laughs> and that you can make fun of anybody, but if anyone makes fun of you... Shame on you. Right? We're going we're to we're gonna take our ball and go home and then sit you with a cease and desist. Just like that. But yeah. they, they were just so cruel to their artists that yeah. their only reason for existing or being known. And in the masthead, they would call them the usual gang of idiots <laughs> instead of like right. listing each artist individually, which I would do because I just had so right. much respect. And also, I think my respect for the creators showed in their work. They were getting paid less oh, I bet they were so that. thankful, too. Because that's just it. I would geek out and go like, oh, man, yeah. I just got your new story, and it's so beautiful. Yeah. And also, I would just know, like, when I signed them a script, that I would get what I would get, and it would just be so wonderful, mm -hmm. you know. And rough. Like, uh, John Severin, who was the main cracked artist, uh, he did a, a beautiful photorealistic humorous style and uh, he started at Mad Magazine and he had a f in fact he helped create Mad Magazine he had a studio with Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder and they were all you know spitballing this idea for a humor magazine that became Mad that Kurtzman only gets the credit for but it was really all these guys together but uh, Severin was with him for the first I think six issues or so and he 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 didn't he didn't go for it so he ended up uh you know going back to marvel and dc working with a lot of companies right. but then uh marvel in the late 50s almost went out of business so one of the uh art directors there saul brodsky took a lot of these art artists that it was called atlas comics at the time and since mad parody uh mad ripoffs were so popular he took all these fantastic artists that were out of work now and help, and started to create this new humor magazine. And so, you know, Severin was the linchpin. Sometimes he would draw like almost two thirds of every issue for wow. months on end, you know. And uh, the thing is, a lot of times Mad called him and said, oh, would you like to come back to Mad? And, you know, they would offer him, you know, maybe like three times as much page rate that he got it cracked, but that was just it. He did like half the book Two thirds of the book sometimes it cracked yeah. every month, whereas at Mad they could only guarantee him like four or five pages a yeah. month, and so even if it was a lot more money, it just it just wasn't. Also, it wasn't as fun for him. Right. Back in 67, 1967, I I'm a, I was a Marvel fanatic. I loved the old 1960s Marvel. I go to the drugstore every month and I wait, you know, sometimes twice a month, looking for the latest editions and. They didn't show up, and I had money in my pocket, and it was burning a hole. So I bought a cracked magazine. I took it home and read it, and uh, I liked it. I thought it was kind of cool. You know, I was kind of brought up in Mad Magazine, and uh, I understood why Mad did what it did. I mean, they had like it's like a TV show. You have your same characters, your same formula. Formula. Yes. You have your that's what people expect. Yeah. We understood why. It's like when Dukes of Hazard changed actors. It really changed. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, when they and, added the monkey, I didn't get it. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I looked at it, I thought, you know, because John Severin, and John, I mean, when you look throughout, you, you see his best working cracks throughout the years, this man was marvelous all the way through. Yeah. I mean, the, the talent that this guy, she, man, he, 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 he could do anything. Right. But and a super My sweetheart. opinion at the time as a 13, 14-year-old <coughs> reader was, yeah, I like it, but there's just a little too much severed. Too much. 
you know, for one issue. <laughs> and I did not realize at the time that decades later, it would be under my tenure that Severin would leave the publication. Disgusting. Disgusting. Well, it was too expensive. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. You know, and John had standards. He had taste. You know, uh, one of the writers wrote an off-color story, and John sent it back. We won't, he won't do it. Yeah. That was refreshing, although I wound up doing it. It was uh, still refreshing. You'll do anything. It was refreshing to see standards, you know, and... Uh, no, I John was a, a gem of a man. And, like, again, like I said, I was in my 20s. I would talk to him a good maybe at least 10 hours a week on the phone because he was living in Denver and I was in New York. And he was just such an incredible influence on so many levels, not just artistic, but he was just a real, like, uh, role model for me and stuff. Well, that's strange because he told me, he says, yeah, that one. <laughs> Mark Todd was a pain in the... No, I'm just kidding. I, I, was doing, just kidding. I was doing a daily comic strip with him around that time that he left Cracked. We had a uh, celebrity biography comic that mm -hmm. ran every day, uh, where because he could just draw celebrities so good and everything. So right. he did a Barney Miller satire once, and I mean it was impeccable. Yeah, impeccable. Uh, he could just he would do like I said, it was photorealistic, but it was still a good caricature. It wasn't like you know he traced a photo, but he he would warp it into humor. So but, now, now that you guys have heard a lot, right? Heard a what? Heard a lot. Oh. Absorbed a lot of information. Do you, does anyone have any questions? I just want to say one more thing about, about Mad, though, about how much they suck. <laughs> there was this uh, cartoonist called Jack Davis, who uh, he ba he was basically the first multimillionaire cartoonist, and it was because he got fired from Mad. He he was one of the original Mad artists, and. Uh, the, the so-called creator of, of MAD, Harvey Kurtzman, took it from it being a color comic book into a black and white magazine. And he wasn't satisfied with how the publisher, Bill Gaines, was taking care of him and the artists. So he left and took a lot of the artists with him and created the, uh, a series of different humor magazines that just didn't do as well. He took it to another level of sophistication from MAD and had more adult humor that I don't know, depending on whether it was the publisher or distribution, just didn't sell as well. And the magazine titles were like Humbug and Trump. It was one of his humor magazines in right. the 60s. But uh, he, so he took a lot of the artists with him, including Jack Davis. So the publisher of Mad Bill Gaines was so pissed that these artists were blackballed. He would not allow these artists to work for him. So Jack Davis had to find other work. He came to Cracked. He did about 100 pages in a year for probably a lot less money. He worked for Sick Magazine, but he also started working, doing covers for Time Magazine, record covers, uh, advertising campaigns, and that's just it. He started becoming a millionaire. He designed movie, he's done so many fantastic movie posters, animation uh, storyboards. So he became a millionaire. And then finally Mad was like, well, would you work for us again? You know, and, and he did. And then later when I was at Cracked, I was like, I called him up and I was like, you know, because we had just gotten Don Martin, I tried to get other artists and right. uh, Davis was like, yeah, well, you know, I'm about ready to retire, so, you know, I don't want to... But he allowed us to do a reprint collection. I did like a hundred page collection of all his That's previous cool. work. And I was like, would you do a new cover for us? And he was like, I could. But he goes, I just did a new stamp for the Postal Service, and I'll give you their phone number, and you can call them and see if you can use that. as." Um, so we did a back cover with the stamp he just did. So all artists are sweethearts, you know, even if they feel obligated. Another artist was Mort Drucker, like I said, did that American Graffiti poster. He was the main movie parody guy for, for Mad Forever. And he might even still be doing stuff for him. He's got to be in his 90s. But I called him, and I was like, we'll match your rate. You own your work. But he was like, well, you know, they, they didn't have health insurance, which we gave some of our artists to. He, and Drucker was like, well, I didn't have health insurance, and I needed like a, a quadruple bypass last year. And Bill Gaines loaned me the money. Oh, no. So he felt obligated. He's got to pay him back. And everything. I'm like, that's just friggin' evil. 
You know, it's just like how much, and that, and then you know, Gaines ended up auctioning off all the original artwork and didn't share any money with the people he didn't like. Shocking. Like, I guess some people got money, but most didn't. Like That's you know, and it's hundreds of thousands of thousands of pages, hundreds by these people who'd worked for decades and everything. So like, well, speaking of Mad Magazine, uh, at one point. And we were getting letters. There was a point in time when Crack Magazine, to my knowledge, wasn't getting any letters. Maybe a few. They were making up their letters pages. Now, this is after mm -hmm. March time. No, it's, I did it. <coughs> <coughs> we were getting letters. Now, keep in mind, we counted emails as letters. But we had tons of them. There was one issue I was putting together, and I could have filled the two-page letters page with letters from people comparing crack favorably to man. And at, I did make the decision to cut one of those pages out and go back to general types of letters because I think I didn't want to just nail mad too much like mm -hmm. we were really going after them. But we had a lot of, uh, a lot of people compared mad, crack favorably to mad during, during my tenure that we saw. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, again, I, I liked Mad Magazine, and I, I saw how Mad functioned. You know, they had a hell of a much better budget than I had. Uh, you could look at Mad Magazine, and it was funny. You know, there was no if ands or buts, there's no guesswork. Cracked during uh, as I took it over, and I saw they were looking. They wanted that laugh out loud stuff too, not just subtle humor. You, they want laughs. They want, and it was hard to get. Humor is a lost art. You look at the look at the comics pages in the newspaper. Are any of those comics funny anymore? Not really. Not really. Not really. No. And I, 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 it's just it's sort of disgusting. That you you want to see funny stuff? Go on Facebook. Look at the mains. Now, there's some <laughs> funny stuff. And that's free, you know. And I keep trying to tell people, I tell staffers, look, guys, hey, we can succeed. I can't do it all myself. Give me stuff that, that see that guy sitting over, that guy mowing his lawn? I want him to want to pay money to buy, not just converted comics fans. We want to go after the mainstream reader, like we were when we were kids. Right. I mean, the comics were mainstream stuff back in the 60s. Of course, they were cheap, too, in the 60s. You know, 10 cents. Four. They were 10 cents, and when they went up to 12 cents, I cut. I, <laughs> uh, the last issue I bought at, at 10 cents, and so that was the last comic I would buy for years, was The Death of Superman, The Imaginary Tale. And I, was, I forget how old was I was. Was it a hoax or an imaginary tale? It was an imaginary tale. Imaginary tale. Or a it dream. It was a great story, too. I cried like a baby. Like, <laughs> uh, I was seven years old reading it, but nonetheless, it was like, it, it, then I, I saw Superman on TV, and I said, look, Mom, he's still alive. And she says, well, actually, son, no, he's not. He killed him. Oh, <laughs> double whammy. Double whammy, you know. But anyway, but That's we funny. did publish one story, and I, I illustrated it. And I will say this, you know, I was... I'm pretty good at it. I was pretty good at it. I did some syndication strips, stuff like that. But I was, I'm not a John Sever. Uh, but I could do it to save my life. I'm much better now. I'm doing caricatures over there. Imagine how good you'll be in 20 years. Imagine, yeah. Just imagine how dead I'll be. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but I did a story. I illustrated the story, and it was about Scooby-Doo. Well, you know, I was really upset with our pit bull at home because it kept pooping all over the place. So we called it Scoopy Poo. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> and and I, I was actually, I'd, I'd finished it, and uh, we were on actually on a zero editorial budget at the time, which was very good for a magazine, but that's what I was saddled with at the company that still owned it at the time. Zero editorial budget. So I had to take, you know, I couldn't use John Severin or something. I had to draw it myself. And uh, after it was done, I was kind of embarrassed about it. I really didn't talk about that for, because I, in every panel, I got Scoopy Poo pooping up a storm. In one panel, I have well. him, I have him uh, whizzing on a tree. In another panel, I have him uh, riding somebody's leg. And you wonder why Severin wouldn't draw it. <laughs> well, no, I, he, that, well, yeah, that I wasn't know, the one. Right. It was the one with Scotty, uh, you know, in his baby making prowess that Severin didn't want to do. But anyway, uh, we got a letter from a mom. And she said, my five-year-old and eight-year-old, she had brought Cracked Magazine, and they were looking, she, she said, she saw him giggling up a storm. She, and she mentioned all those things I just did, you know, riding the leg and pooping and whizzing. She says, I have just one thing to say to you, keep up the good work. Uh, <laughs> and keep so squeezing it out. We, yeah, he was, we, we had shit and bricks. I mean, we had that thing, and pardon my French. 
But, you know, I saw, I, I, me, I like the juvenile humor. And when I was a kid, when I was 12 years old, I got sent to the principal's office for drawing a farting bikini girl who's, who had blown herself out of a chimney with a fart. <laughs> now, I, I wasn't into obscenity. I wasn't into sexual humor. I was into the juvenile humor. You know, the, the, we had one page with different kinds of flatulence, you know, the, the tweeters, the woofers, and so on and so forth. That kind of stuff I ate up as a kid, and I still do. <laughs> but in my time with crack, you know, mad back then in the 60s, you had the anti-establishment, which was first appearing. You know, because prior to that, you didn't really go anti-establishment. So Matt had a theme. Cracked was able to ride and follow that theme and pick up, you know, and, and, and crack because there was a thirst for it. We found working for the tabloids, and I worked for Weekly World News for, you know, nearly 15 years. You know what Weekly World News is, the black and white tabloid. Elvis is alive, and he is alive. He told me on the phone. <laughs> and so we, you know, I was in the public, you know, we sold a million a week in our heyday. So I mean, I'm not, I'm no newcomer to publications and sales because we were made privy as staffers. Our heads rolled if we didn't get sales. So we, they made sure we knew what the sales were. So we knew kind of everything every week, every week for months and months so we could sweat out our jobs. Hmm. And uh, so anyway, with Cracked, we, we, we uh, did, we, we tried to, what, what Cracked eventually evolved into, actually, the sort of a the Cracked.com site that you see is really uh, a, 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 a watered down inquire. Extremely watered down. It, it, it's you know, and, and basically we have. I mean, it, they it took the name. That's about it. You don't see anything. We don't even consider it to be Cracked, no. per se. And so you know, but there's. Well, like I said, the most common thing I was like. I hear it's like it used to be a magazine. Yeah, they don't even know, and yet it was there. And, and a lot of movie stars, you know, we would get. Oh, likewise, yeah. We would get product placement. We'd get phone calls from Hollywood. Can we use Cracked in our, you know, thing? It was on uh, Family Guy once, I think, wasn't it? Or on The Simpsons. The Simpsons, yeah. Simpsons. And uh, you know, you see. Well, yeah. I mean, years before, we we'd send original art to to actors, and they'd do photos, or like you know, we had Beetlejuice people <laughs> sending us great letters. Well. Talk, <clears throat> talking earlier about letters, when I first started, uh, we got a pile of, of letters from the publisher in Florida, sent them to New York that hadn't gone through. So I was going through the old letters, and they were all like, yeah, you suck, you ripping off Matt. One actually had a dead fish in it, which yeah. I didn't know at the time was a mafia thing. Like, you know, <laughs> if, if you get a dead fish, it's like, you better watch your ass. And it's like, and it, it was there for a couple of months. It soaked through all this other mail. I mean, but within two years, like I said, I had my spies at Mad. Mad started getting the hate mail because we had less of a lead time from when you know the books were drawn to when they were printed and on the newsstand. We we did it within like two or three months, whereas like Mad took like a good six months. Mad had like seven editors. I had one editor, me. And so they would sit around and go like, oh, let's do this. Let's wait till the numbers come in on this movie. Where it's like, oh, kids are going to love this movie. I didn't need to, you know, figure right. out what. So, like, within two years, Mad, my spies were telling Mad were getting letters like, you ripped off Crack's Batman parody. They had it out three months before you did and everything, you know. And it was just like, and that was another thing. I, I dove into it. Like, you know, like, I'm talking specifically about the Batman movie from 89, Tim Burton, Jack Nicholson. Uh, I actually went to England and crashed the set because a girlfriend's friend was the assistant art director. So we were able to crash the set while they were shooting it. And I was walking on the sets taking photos and of the miniatures of the Batmobile and all this stuff. And Mad was owned by Warner Brothers, and they couldn't get any of this material. So, like, I got all this material about a year before the movie came out. So we were able to do our parody while the movie was in the theater, while Mad's parody was, like, six months later. And so, like, we, I just kept doing that with all kinds of stuff. And so, like, you know, back then it was like, it was like newspapers. Like, we beat them, you know, with a, we got the scoop on Batman, you know. <laughs> It was a different world, you know. But. Yeah, the first thing I did when I took over as editor was I, I asked my associates, 
let's get some scripts here. And, and we knew the X-Men movie was coming mm. out in three months. I said, we've got the time right now. We'll start working. We worked on the issue that was due three months later. We started that immediately. We pushed out a first issue, and then we went to work on the others. It was the X-Men parody. Right. And uh, now, I will say this, too. And one thing that, during my tenure at Crack, uh, and Mark talks, uh, talks about some of the artists that, you know, the world-famous artists that worked with Crack and him. And there are a number of artists that uh, got their break with Crack who went on to become really world famous artists through me. Does anyone thank me for it? Uh, no. <laughs> do you get a dinner? I didn't <laughs> get, di uh, let's not, we won't discuss too much. But what they used, they, what they were doing is they'd use me, they, they'd get their stuff and cracked, sure. and hey, Once you're hey look mad, here's Mars what point. I'm doing, yeah. and all of a sudden, they're not working for Crack anymore. Is that anymore. like Tom Richmond? Did uh, you use him you first? might say so. He's a great artist. Great artist, but hey, he, they, they, Mad said he looked too much like Mark Drucker. Yeah. Tom told me that. So I said, come to, here, we'll use you. We took his first parody that he had submitted to Mad, we rejigged it, changed the ending, and paid him for it, ran it in Cracked Magazine. And then he did two more. And then I get the phone call, oh, I'm going to Mad now. Well, thanks a lot, buddy. Well, we'd have a lot of artists that would imitate the Mad artists, like, like Walter Bergen, for instance, we would do Jack Davis or Mort Drucker. And when, when I got artists like that, I was like, you're not going to make money this way. You make money by having an original style that no one else can do. Exactly. And almost every single artist in the world starts out being inspired by an artist. Sure. And they'll emulate that artist. But mm -hmm. you gotta, you got to evolve and create your own style and you become your own commodity and then... That's how you get your own, yeah, you, yeah following your and own stuff. following because yeah. people are digging what your your art style, your your unique take on things, and that's how. I mean, you look at mainstream comics like Bill Sienkiewicz, yeah. who some of you guys might know, that used to do X Men and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He started out as a Neil Adams clone, yeah. and would just like it would be pure swipes, but then he became his own style and. There's so many artists like that. And it's Didn't like, Barry Smith start out as oh, a Kirby clone? Uh, bad Absolutely. Kirby clone. Yeah, bad, bad <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 we knew, you know, we know who all the artists all are. Guns, we yeah. grew up with all these artists. We knew them by name. I could look at a comic book and say, tell you who drew it without even seeing it. Who penciled it and who inked it. However, however, and, and the old guard artists will tell you this. You know, we're talking about art styles. We're talking about, you know, big names, so on and so forth. You got to remember that like in the 40s and the 50s, your average person, which is your most important person, by the way, when we speak of average person, hey, those are the people that paid the bill. You know, I, met, I, I think I spent, uh, I checked, I invested about, I spent $27 buying Marvel Comics during my run as a fan. So I made my contribution to Marvel success. So I think I spent about 27 bucks buying all those issues at 12 cents each. Right. But nobody, I mean, yes, you had this fan base develop, the comic cons develop, the collector, your collectors stuff. But your average person didn't care who wrote the books or who drew them. They just got all they cared about is that they got, and they were entertained. They enjoyed what they read. Well, see. yeah, writers and artists back then, it was a job. I mean, there was no fan base. They didn't care about. Well, they didn't even the get credits. Artwork. So it wasn't like, you know, yeah, I mean, it was like with movies, like you go like, oh, I like this actor in this movie. Right. So next time I see that name, like comics didn't do that yeah. well until the 80s. I mean, you had inside credits, you know, in 60s with some titles, but right. not Marvel all did. of them. Marvel started with the credits, you know, the heavy credits yeah. where you saw the little box. You know. Well, only because of Stan, because like Stan wanted his name. Yeah, he wanted <laughs> his name. But well, and original artwork was just like put in drawers. You know, or you, chopped up and or, used as blotter or yeah, something. Yeah, they just, they weren't even, because it wasn't They would be given out then. to like a little kid who walked in off yeah. the street, like, I love yeah. this comic. It's like, here, take all this Kirby art. Super comic <laughs> artists didn't get really fan base until the 80s. Well, and by the same token, the artists didn't care either. They were just, they wanted the paycheck. Right. And it would just be like, that There's stuff's just going to collect and gather dust. What am I going to do with it? You know, people want to draw, for instance. I, I get a lot of people who show me their work. You know, I'm a, I'm a caricature artist. And I see, I see a lot of kids, oh, look, my daughter draws this, you know, so and so forth. And, you know, what they're missing today that we had as kids was the inspiration. Well, I, I wanted to draw comics. I wanted to draw like this guy, you know. 
we had that motivation, but today's kids don't really have that that much because a lot of your comic books today are computer driven. You look at Mark Todd stuff out there, that's more like the personable stuff that I like to look at. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't like the cut the computer driven stuff. I mean, I do digital work myself, and it's not doesn't look like the computer driven stuff. But the um, and I, you know, and I, I actually. I'm getting older because I lose track of some of the things that I'm trying to say. When Crack Magazine, during the latter part, I was looking for investors. What the hell is that? <laughs> anyway, Sad I wound trumpet. up going head to head with another major publication for a television show. It was being uh, offered by Phil Roman. And so Sorry. It was, we, we went up <laughs> against the National Lampoon vying for this show that Film Roman wanted to do. And it, like, it came down to two of it. And fine, so I had a chat with the lady who was running it. And I said, well, the last time I looked, Cracked Magazine is publishing, but Ooh, National Lampoon, Lampoon yeah. is not. But they had a bunch of movies that people knew of. And At that but time, it we didn't won matter. the day. Yeah. We won the day. Oh, remember that crack TV show? Yeah, uh, what crack TV show? <laughs> anyway, what happened is that I took it up north to my hometown up there where I met with investors, and there was this one surly graphic artist who was brought in as an, as an advisor to one of them, and he said, well, I looked at it. He said, what about this crack TV show? You, you, you're giving them two years of uh, uh, ancillary uh, product uh, profits. I said, yeah. Well, I don't like that deal. Well, what the hell? We might have been given in two years of ancillary product things, but what we were getting was years of na massive sure. national exposure for a publication, which would have tripled our circulation. Well, see, that's a, like you say. I mean, Lampoon wasn't in publication, but everyone even still knows that name Lampoon, National Lampoon, even though they haven't been in print since we were in diapers. Yeah, but like, National <laughs> Lampoon in 71 was a whole lot better than the National oh, Lampoon right. of the later yeah. 80s. Uh, Neil Adams, sure. son of God, I'll never forget oh, yeah. that. I love that. What about their Mad parody? I didn't see that. Oh, that was so hilarious. Ernie Cologne did Citizen Kane as Citizen Gaines. Oh, really? And, I oh, know it's that. genius about him selling out all his principles. Well, actually, we only got a couple minutes. I don't know if anyone's got a question or. We have cracked magazines over there. I have uh, one one issue I'm giving away free. Come and get it. Well, uh, how can you lose? The rest are you pay money for. Mark, right next to me, he's got a lot of his books, the current books that you got. What have you got going? Oh. You both you guys? Go so, ahead. Yeah, I'm next to Mark. I've got... Um, yeah, it's the triumvirate. we got three tables together. So I brought... So, like, I've got Red Sonja that I worked on. i got uh, Satellite Falling from IDW. I've got a few copies of that. Um, a new book is called Zombies Were Human Too. It deals with telling zombie stories of who and what they were before they became zombies. Ah. Um, it's a graphic novel. We did a Kickstarter. It got funded, which was amazing. It's going to be printed. We're doing volume two right now. So we've got a few books there. If you want to buy one, I've got a lot of original stuff from like uh, Evil Dead 2 and a bunch of other stuff, you know, book-wise. I'm, I'm an inker by trade. That's pretty much what I, when I went into comic books, I wanted to be the guy who finishes the, the page. You know what I mean? Brush inker. So that's primarily what I've done. Um, but yeah, he's doing a lot of really cool commissions and he's got sketch. I got a bunch of books I put out yeah. using a lot of creators I worked at with Crack to like uh, this John Severn we've been talking about. I got a Western book by him from he's the He's got 60s. some great E-Man stuff. Yeah. I saw that. So yeah, we got some neat stuff. Come by. So thanks for hanging out. Yeah. Appreciate and I'm like doing caricatures. I'm known as Captain Cartoon in yes, South Florida. So if you're in the west east coast of Florida, West Palm Beach areas, or whatever, I'm at restaurants. I do those things. It's kind of fun. No one looking over your. Everyone wants you to succeed. There's no one stabbing you in the back. <laughs> so that's I really adapted to that. And I thought, and years ago I would say, over my dead body, you won't catch me dead doing caricatures. <laughs> but that's what this getup is. But Captain Cartoon is also actually a character that I'm looking to market as a character. Uh. You know? That's Everything cool. he draws comes to life and saves the day. It's like the old Dick Tracy cartoons where Dick Tracy would call, go, 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 man. <laughs> and instead of seeing Dick Tracy doing anything, you're watching this Speedy Gonzalez running around. Is that, was he Dick Tracy? Yeah, well, there was, no, no, yeah, Speedy that was the Chinese guy. Too. No, it was go, go, 
Gomez was Dick Tracy. Yeah. Uh, the Chinese guys was Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe. <laughs> Joe Jiu Jitsu, yeah. So, uh, so he was Japanese. So actually. I thought of Captain Cartoon, where, you know, he draws up like, on his magic pad and his big monster comes to life, and then the cartoon's about the monster saving the day or the character saving the day. You know, it's like the old Dick Tracy. I'll thing. be one of your characters. You are a character. <laughs> <laughs> you already are. I, I Funny you should say that. I always hear the name Mark Todd, and I'm thinking, this guy's. I mean, I've heard that name. I mean, that, that's a cartoon name. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I tried. Well, he, he just told me earlier, he was at a bar last night and saw this and like 90 year old guy and figured that must be me. <laughs> that might right? be him. I didn't know. That. <laughs> this is the first time I met, met I put out a cartoon of me in a, a high powered, jet powered walker with uh, Gatling guns. I'm going to shoot his, you know. Shoot so it, feel free, know. come on, stop by. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll chat. I'll tell you about some. Thanks so much for dropping by. Coming up and, yeah. So but thanks. thank you guys, you helped make this fun. We're going to clap now. We really appreciate it.